Please take your Bible and turn to the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And then when you find Romans chapter 8, hold your spot. I want to look at a very familiar verse by way of introduction. 2 Timothy 3.16. You're finding Romans chapter 8, where we will look at the lesson. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. I would say would be utilized to complement what we're doing on Wednesday night. Wednesday night, of course, this week we had vacation Bible school and a very successful vacation Bible school, especially uh, seeing circumstance with uh, coronavirus, all the things that are going on. Had a high night of 31, about an average of 24 uh, every night, and then uh, Wednesday, we brought a lesson on Bible basics centered around five words. We got through one word simply because of introduction and so forth on Wednesday, and that word was inspiration. I would encourage you that if you are uh, not particularly a, a Wednesday night individual, that you would come participate I would like to, over the next couple of Wednesdays, finish those five words. And it has to do with uh, Bible basics and how the Lord draws you into Himself through a study of the Word of God. So very important, this day that we live in. And it, it hinges around, and one of the key verses of Vacation Bible School is 2 Timothy 3.16, and I would say with the leading direction of these messages and lessons, uh, this month is based on building and, and what God is, is doing. And the theme of the Vacation Bible School was, is not this the carpenter? And we discussed that about Jesus being a carpenter in his earthly sojourn and all that he has and is building. In 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16, this very familiar uh, verse, most of you could quote it, but if you look at it, the Bible says, All Scripture is given by inspiration. Now that was the first word that we used on Wednesday night in a basic Bible study, that we are approaching the Word of God, that it is God's Word. It was given by inspiration. We said and we emphasized that means spirit in. Job 32, and I believe it's verse 8 if my memory is right, but uh, it's in Job where that word inspiration is found as well. Inspiration of the Almighty. Anyway, all scripture is given by inspiration. So I approach the word of God that it is God's <coughs> word. And then you notice here, and is profitable for doctrine without finishing the rest of the verse is profitable for doctrine now doctrine divides and doctrine is why you have churches on every corner it's why you have all the isms and schisms and splits and divides it's because of doctrine and we are compelled encouraged commanded to rightly divide the word of truth and this has to do in doctrine well the book of Romans that I ask you to turn to Romans chapter 8 Romans is certainly a book full of doctrine and uh, it, it does matter what you believe it's good to be sincere and dogmatic in what you believe but believing right and believing uh, the book and so uh, when we say that we are Baptist, there is uh, obviously we can use the name Baptists as an acronym of what we believe, not going down that pathway this morning. We have done that and we need to do it often. But we believe that Baptist is Bible. 
And so we stand for the Word of God, and we want to be able to give an answer to every man that asketh us of the hope that lies within us, with meekness and in fear. But Romans is certainly a book of doctrine. In Romans and in chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Reading a portion of this passage together, I'll read out loud, you follow along silently, and then we will come back and make our comments. Romans chapter 8, and in verse 17. Romans chapter 8, and in verse 17. The Bible says, and if children, this is talking about children of God, and you being able to call God your father, then heirs. This is the obvious, per se, in a physical sense, but now this is in the spiritual. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. That should put a smile on your face and hope within your heart. Now watch this. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon, that's down south talk, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now the lesson thought title is not new or original, but it is, and you'll see these two words in this portion of scripture, from groaning to glory. The Bible says in verse 19, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject of vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subject, subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now, he makes it clear of what he's stating in verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. This has to do all the way back to the sin that took place in the garden. As by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Romans 5.12 There was a dramatic change the moment that Adam sinned. And uh, all of creation groans. It groaneth. You can no longer uh, go up and uh, pet wild animals, per se, and, and things as before. There was a dramatic change. Well, the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And that includes you and I, by the way, the older that we get and so forth. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, Holy Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, or that is, the redemption of our body means you're saved by the grace of God, sealed by the Holy Spirit of God until the day of redemption, but there is groaning that takes place. And the older that we get, that increases. And we have the hope of the redemption of the body. The body didn't get saved, but by the grace of God, we will get a glorified body as we read along here and as you know. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Now this is a biblical hope. It's not I think so, it's a definite so, but it is the hope that lies within us. We understand by and by things are going to be better by and by. We have the whole picture laid out to us through the word of God of what's going to take place. But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. It means that with the eye of faith you can see heaven. With the eye of faith you understand that your loved ones are in heaven. By the eye of faith you understand that uh, Christ died on the cross, was buried, rose again the third day. He rose, he ever liveth to make intercession for us, seated at the right hand of God the Father, and soon one day coming back for us. That's biblical-based hope. 
It's not that you think so. You have it in God's written word, the inspired word of God on uh, white paper, black ink, God's word on it. And that's the hope. And that's what you hope. And because of that, you can have some patience. Patience, the body is groaning, the body is hurting, the body is deteriorating, and so forth, and so is everything else. But by the grace of God, the hope is the blessed hope, soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Things getting more and more difficult. Civil unrest. All of the famines taking place. All of the disease taking place. But by the grace of God, that's because the whole creature groaneth till now. So he comes back. But we have the blessed hope within us. Verse 26. Likewise, not only the hope that lies within you, but the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, also helpeth our infirmities. He says, go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. It won't always be this way. There will be no more death dying. Things will be better by and by for the child of God. That's the manifestation of the sons of God. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Sometimes it gets so bad that you're just laying there in your prayer closet. You're hurting. The Holy Spirit of God makes intercession for you when I a broken and contrite heart. And he that searcheth the hearts, verse 27, knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Verses 29 and 30 are where we get into the lesson this morning, and it is doctrinal. The Bible says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, the lesson is from groaning to glory. The Bible says in verse 22, the whole creation groaneth. Verse 23, the Bible says, even we groan within ourselves. So there is groaning. And then in verse 30, it ends up in being glorified. From groaning to glory. But keeping with the thought of what God is building, this is God at work in your life. This is God at work in the life of a Christian. Holding your spot for just a moment, hold the spot in Romans 8. And look at Philippians 1 6. Philippians 1 6. <clears throat> Holding your spot in Romans 8. From groaning to glory. All of us have some groaning, some difficulty. There is the groaning of the physical body. As we get older, there's groaning mentally within our families, physically, financial. There's groaning. And it's not going to be perfect in this life and on this earth. But in Romans chapter 8, you see from groaning to glory, God at work in the life of the Christian. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, notice this. Being confident of this very thing, that he, God, 
which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That means the return of Christ. He will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So this is for the, the Christian, the individual Christian, that you can be confident of this, that he which hath begun a good work in you will continue performing it, will keep working on you until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, in this verse, we are calling this verse for the lesson, that's the promise. He says, you can be confident of this, this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you, which is salvation, will perform it. <coughs> and so if God says he's going to do it, he's going to do it. And that is a promise. How long will he be doing it? Until the day of Jesus Christ. Or until Christ comes back to get me as an individual or us collectively. He will perform it. God will be doing that through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's the promise. And you need to be confident in that. We're already approaching the Bible that it is the inspired word of God. It's God's word and this is a promise. So you accept that, that that's the promise. That God that has begun the good work in you will perform it or keep working on you until the day of Jesus Christ. That's the promise. If you go back to Romans chapter 8 and in verse 29 and 30, that's the process. You have a promise. He's still working on me. This promise says that he that hath begun a good work in you will, that's the definite, will perform it, keep working on you until Jesus comes back. It's a promise. Romans 8, 29 and 30 is the process. We're going from groaning in this body to glory in the Spirit. In Romans chapter 8, the Bible says, verse 29, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, you notice what you are predestinated to, to be conformed to the image of his Son. God is making you like Jesus. And everything that's not like Jesus is being taken away. Thus, part of the groaning. Because the flesh does not like to release that. Now watch. Predestination has to do with your being conformed to the image of His Son. We don't know what we shall be, but we know that when we shall see Him, we will be like Him. Foreknowledge, we use this word, it's a big word. God is omniscient. That means God is all-knowing. And, and, and you, no matter where you are in your growth with God, you want in your heart to know that God is all-knowing. You want to understand and believe that there's nothing more powerful than God. If there was, that would be God. God is all-knowing. He's omniscient. It has to do with foreknowledge. Now, God knows the beginning from the ending. Now, that, that's obvious. He is the beginning. He is the ending. He is the Alpha. He is the Omega. Revelation 1.8. He knows the beginning from the ending. Now, let's dig down deep, and I'm not going to go off the deep end on this, but let me just put this out to you. Does God know the beginning from the ending? Yes. Well, I'm holding my spot in Romans, and uh, you, you understand where this is. There's so many passages that say the same thing, but in Revelation 1.8, the Bible says, I am Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. That's Revelation 1.8. 
In fact, another one of my favorites is Colossians chapter 1. And in verse 16 and 17. Colossians 1, 16, 17. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Now watch this, verse 17. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And so this is foreknowledge, that he is omniscient. He knows the beginning from the ending. Well, then let me ask you this. If God is omniscient, and He is, does He know who will get saved and who won't get saved? By default, He has to know who will get saved and who won't get saved. And yet, with our loving, omniscient God, God allows the will of man to enter into the salvation of His own soul. Show you a couple things. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3. God does not force anybody to get saved, just the same as God does not force anybody to serve Him after He gets saved. God gives you and I a choice. In Jeremiah chapter 31 and in verse 3, the Bible says this. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Have I drawn thee. Now, notice another one in John chapter 10. In John chapter 10, and in verse 14. The Bible says, Jesus speaking of himself says, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. He knows his sheep and they know him. And yet God allows man to enter in to the will of his soul salvation. Notice this in Ephesians chapter 1. One. And in verse 11, I'm talking about foreknowledge from Romans chapter 8, verse 30, because God is omniscient. And uh, it's not only the obvious, but it is declared throughout Scripture. He knows the beginning from the ending. So that means God does know who will get saved and who won't get saved, but yet He allows them to be born and allows them to have a free will in the matter of their soul salvation. In Ephesians 1, verse 11, the Bible says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. What is it that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ? What's your part? Trusting in Christ. Who and how, verse 13, in whom, Christ, ye also trusted. How? After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed. You had to hear the word of God, the gospel, death, burial, resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they believe in whom they have not heard? And so forth, Romans. How did you get saved? Salvation is of the Lord. Amen. Praise God. But the Holy Spirit of God takes the Word of God and makes it real to your heart. 
that ye that we should be to the praise of his glory who did what first trusted in Christ you have a part the gospel is preached the Holy Spirit of God takes the Word of God brings conviction trusting has to take place repentance then conversion if you've trusted in Christ not trying trusting now watch in whom Jesus ye also trusted how after that you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in whom also after that you believed heard it believed it you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest Holy Spirit of promise is the earnest of our inheritance Remember, you're heirs with God, joint heirs with Christ, until the redemption of the purchased possession, Christ coming back for us unto the praise of His glory. Now that's deep, but that's doctrine. And if you don't rightly divide it, you'll go off one end or the other. One end is a Calvinistic uh, viewpoint that... Uh, God saves you no matter what. You go the other end, Armenian, and you can lose it. Bible in the, in the straight doctrine that, uh, yes, God has foreknowledge, obviously, but God does not go against your will to save your soul. You hear, you trust, you believe. And if it's from the heart, then by the grace of God, you're sealed until the day of redemption. What did he predestinate me to, preacher? To be conformed to the image of his Son. And one day you will be. One day you and I, who are saved, born again, children of God, will be like Jesus. To have a glorified body, like unto his glorified body. We have a vile body now, the body didn't get saved, the Holy Spirit saved our soul, our spirit saved. You have two nature within you, and that's the war that's going on within you. But one day, by the grace of God, we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye and get a new body. Amen. Equipped for heaven. And walking on that street of gold with Jesus and with our loved ones. Look at 1 Peter 1, 2. Romans chapter 8 verse 30 is from groaning to glory. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 2. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. The word we're looking at is foreknowledge. How, preacher? Through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Now listen to me carefully. We don't have a lot of time left. Don't get hung up if God's going to save them, He will. If God's going to save me, He will. You have a part. You hear the Word of God. You believe the Word of God. You trust the Word of God. I'm trusting in Jesus. I'm trusting in what God said. I've approached the Bible as God's holy Bible, inspired Word of God. God said it. And so then I, I believe that. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. How, preacher? Through sanctification of the Spirit. Sanctification means set apart. <coughs> Simply means set apart. Sanctification of the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit, who is the author of the Word of God, takes the Word of God and speaks to your heart, and then there is a change of heart. He gives me a new heart that I, I believe that. I act upon that. Moses saw the burning bush. Moses stepped towards the burning bush. God then spoke to him out of the burning bush. You hear the word of God. The seed is planted by the grace of God. 
and then it takes root and grows from there. This is set apart for the service of the Lord. So it's sanctified by the grace of God. Sanctified first means in a position that I am positionally in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So that when the Holy Spirit of God speaks to my heart, I believe, I repent, I accept Christ as my Lord and Savior. I am then set apart for God. I belong to Him. He belongs to me. I am His people. I am His person. He's my God. Amen. That's positional sanctification. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. How was it? When I heard the Word of God, believed the Word of God, Holy Spirit of God then set me apart positionally the day that I got saved. Unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. You obeyed Christ when you got saved. Repentance and faith. But do you obey Him on a daily basis? That is progressive sanctification. Progressive sanctification is God's continual work in you until the day of Jesus Christ. It's walking towards Jesus. It's walking towards Jesus. I keep walking towards Jesus and then one day He just takes me up home. God in election. In 1 Peter 1.20, God in election, verse 20, the Bible says, who, and the who is speaking about who he's talking about in verse 19, Christ Barely or truly was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. This is saying that Christ was foreordained to be born to die as the sinless Son of God, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world from the foundation of the world. And God is omniscient and has elected this, that His Son was going to go to Calvary and die on the cross. God chose that from the foundation of the world. Jesus knowingly did that, set His face like a flint. God has elected that anybody, any whosoever will, that believes in the sinless sacrifice, Jesus Christ dying on the cross to pay your sin debt, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God has elected that anybody that chooses to believe shall be saved. And whosoever won't, they don't. You have a will. You have a part. It's hearing and believing. I'll use this verse uh, in, in closing. To refute and then to make my stand where I stand against Calvinism. I'm not saying God is not omniscient. He is. In foreknowledge, God knows. Does God know who's going to get saved and who doesn't get saved? He has to. He's God. But God said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Last book of the Bible. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that is a thirst say, Come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. But that person has to hear that and then act upon it.
from groaning to glory has to do with the foreknowledge of God, and God's got it all planned out. 2 Peter 1.10, the Bible says that Peter, writing under inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, says this. Second Peter 1.10 starts off with wherefore. And so you know from Bible study when there's a wherefore, you're asking why is it therefore, and it's for verse 9, for the verses that precede. And he's talking about soul salvation and your sins being purged, which is the main thing. Verse 10 says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. Now here as we close, if, hypothetically, not my position, that God saves from hell who He will, and allow us to go to hell who he chooses and calls that electing some to heaven and electing some to hell if you get to the grassroots. If God does that without your intervention at all, irresistible grace per se, then how would verse 10 apply to you and I making our calling in election sure. The plea is that you and I make sure we're saved. Your calling of God, election, salvation, sure. How can I be sure? Because the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This morning, how would I make sure? There has to have been a time when I repented of my sins and asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart and save me from my sins. And if it was from the heart, not just the head, then you can be sure. God's foreknowledge, there's no doubt, but you have a part in that. You hear the word of God, you trust it in Christ, and then praise God. God is still working on us from groaning to glory. And I'll try to finish this next week. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible study that you've allowed us to enter into. A doctrinal book and a doctrinal study. Dear God, thank you for the assurance of salvation. Dear Lord, thank you that you are working on us. We're groaning now. We're going to be glorified one day with you. Help us, dear Lord, to act upon it. Praying for the service to follow us, that you'll bring people to church, and that you'll be honored and glorified. If somebody comes in lost, please save their soul. In Jesus' name, amen.